Tonight, America votes. Close battles for the House of Representatives and the Senate revealed just how divided the United States really is. A huge night in American politics. Biden and Trump not on the ballot for these midterm elections, but definitely on the minds of voters. It's a choice between two fundamentally different visions of America. You need to vote every Democrat out of office. It's their election, but the impact will be felt everywhere. Special CBC News coverage of what it means for the world, for Canada, for you. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault and Ian Hennemansing. You are looking at a live shot of Capitol Hill. It's now early Wednesday morning. Across the United States, polls are now closed. But how these midterm elections could affect the balance of power in Congress, still very unclear. Some key races still too close to call. Thank you for being with us as we track the results of this historic night. We'll bring you today's other news in just a bit, but we begin with special coverage of the U.S. midterm elections you'll only get from CBC News. We're looking at the impact of this vote on Canada and the world. We have a team of journalists tracking developments. The National's co-host, Ian Hanamansing, is home. He's here in studio monitoring the results. Also coming home to us tonight with analysis is our Washington uh, senior Washington correspondent, Paul Hunter, as well as Kelly Jane Torrance of the New York Post and Karun Demergen of the Washington Post. Plus... We have reporters on the ground in states where some of the key races are unfolding and our chief political correspondent, Rosemary Barton, on what Ottawa is watching tonight. So we're going to get to the reporters in a moment, but first, a look at where things stand this hour in the United States. It is now just after 1 a.m. Eastern. This was Hawaii a little earlier, one of the last states where polls closed this evening. And so let's bring in Ian, who is tracking the results where are we right now? Well, I'll tell you, when I was walking to the broadcast center after going to get a bite to eat around supper time, I was listening to some American feeds, and they were talking about bracing for this red tsunami, mm -hmm. right? And it was going to wipe the Democrats out of the House of Representatives. We'll take a look at where we're at now with the House of Representatives. 20, uh, uh, 218 is how many districts you need to hold to control the House. And right now, the Republicans leading in elected with fewer than that. They only have to flip five districts in order to take control. We really did think hours ago that was just a matter of time. Well, so far, that has not come to pass, but still a lot of counting to be done. And then when we look at the Senate, this number is close. We went into the night, it being close, but don't be misled by this because there are some incredibly close races that could change that number. So let's take a look at some of those Senate numbers as of right now, 10 o'clock Pacific time. And here we have what I think a lot of people might have considered a surprise a few hours ago, which is in a state, uh, well, this particular Senate seat was held by a Republican. And uh, throughout the evening, we've seen John Fetterman, the former lieutenant governor of the state, in the lead. He remains in the lead with a lot of the votes being counted. If this were to, to end up being declared elected by the CBC decision desk, it would be a pickup by the Democrats. Let's look at another Senate race. <laughs> this one has been close all night. It's kind of gone back and forth. And right now, as you can see, the incumbent Democratic senator, Raphael Warnock, is in the lead. As I've been telling people through the evening, maybe you've been watching our coverage on CBC News Network, you need to get 50% plus one at least to be, the, to be declared the winner in Georgia. There's a third candidate, a libertarian candidate, and he is siphoning up enough votes that neither of these candidates has hit that 50% plus one threshold. So as of right now, though as you can see, almost one in five votes still to be counted, but as of right now, this would be headed for December the 6th runoff with the potential that the control of the Senate would all focus on this one Senate seat in Georgia. And let's take a look at one other race. We've been waiting all night for numbers to come in from Nevada. As we've been saying, they don't report the numbers until the last person has gone through the lineup and, and voted. And then all of a sudden you get a, a dump of a certain number of votes that have been counted. So we have about a third of the districts reporting to this point. And, uh, and the Democratic incumbent senator is leading here. Um, but still, we have a lot uh, of counting still to go in that state. 
A lot of attention on Georgia. Mm -hmm. That will continue until December the 6th, but certainly over the next hour or so, I think there'll be a lot of attention on those numbers coming in through Nevada. Can the Democrats hold on to their control of the Senate? Can the Republicans have a net gain of one? We still don't know the answer to that. Right, Ian, thank you. And, and Paul, as, as you listen to this, everyone has been talking throughout the evening about needing to wait for Georgia. <laughs> It might not be the case that they need to wait for Georgia. You know, this uh, this this doesn't quite hit um, the feeling I had in Trump headquarters in 2016, watching him and his family walk out in terms mm -hmm. of gobsmacked mm -hmm. surprise. But I look at the numbers for the House, and we, we did we did not expect anything like this tonight. We knew the Senate was going to be tight, but if you you know if there's a chance the Democrats come out of this with 51, let's say. Who would, have, who would have thunk that at the beginning of the night? But the House, like, this was supposed to be the moment where everybody would be saying, well, looking ahead to 24, that Donald Trump has the, the wind in his sails now. He was, you know, the, 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 the red wave came and it's going to change everything. And it's not there, right? And, and Biden has a bit, of, this is a bit of a, Biden can feel pretty good tonight. He, regardless of where the count ends up, if it's this mm -hmm. close... This is, a, this is this was by not losing big, even if he loses the house. That's a curious uh, thing that he know? could lose he could lose both chambers and still end up thinking, hmm, not bad. It could have been worse, which is a good thing. That's a, is that a double negative? Is that is, is I that don't a, know. It's I mean it's, <laughs> it's too it's late to deep do math, in the middle of the night, <laughs> and I, I'm good with it. I don't. <laughs> if you are, I am. Okay, Paul. Thanks very much. Um, why don't we move on to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania? We keep talking about Pennsylvania. Katie Simpson uh, is there at Democrat John Fetterman's headquarters. So, Katie, you know, this is one of the closest, most pivotal Senate races in the country. What is the latest, the feeling where you are? Adrian, you are not going to believe what has just happened in the last 15 minutes oh, no. or so. We are sitting up there. Oh, yeah, no. So um, one American news outlet, NBC News, has called the race for Fetterman. And at that point, everyone got alerts on their phones because everyone signs up for e-blast and all that kind of stuff. And so the supporters that were still here all gathered down behind me. They pulled out the podium. And it has been absolutely electric in here. We've not seen other news networks make this same call. We were not expecting this to happen today. We thought this was going to be election week, not election night and now we are just waiting for John Fetterman to come out at any moment again it's just one news network that at least that I'm aware of that has made the call NBC News others have not yet the CBC News projection Jack desk has not yet but the crowd here is celebrating like it's fully confirmed they are chanting his name and again this was expected to be a race that was too close to call with ballots uh, ballots take a long time to count in Pennsylvania because, um, oh, I think, he's, I think he's about to pop out. We're starting to see things change up behind me. Again, we're expecting uh, this to take a long time for the ballots to be counted because they don't start counting absentee ballots and uh, mail-in ballots until day of. And there were some other technical issues with counting votes in Pennsylvania that was going to slow things down. NBC made a call. Others have not. But people in here are celebrating like it's a for sure thing. We're waiting for John Fetterman to come out at any moment. So we'll see what he has to say. Katie Simpson, what on earth would we do without you? Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. I know you love your job. Right on, Katie. Thank you. So I have uh, two American-based journalists sitting with us, with Paul and I up here at the desk, a Karun Demergent, uh, correspondent with The Washington Post, Kelly Jane Torrance, an editor at The New York Post. You're, you've been working the phones. I've been watching you. Uh, busy night. So this, you know, it's close. Pennsylvania is certainly look, looking favorable for Fetterman. Uh, then, you know, it's not over yet. Kelly Jane, surprise you? That did surprise me. That was, I think, one of my biggest surprises of the night. And, you know, I was talking to uh during the break. And, uh, you know, a few weeks ago, I would not have been that surprised. But mm -hmm. the polling really changed after that debate in which Pennsylvania voters first really got to look at, uh, you know, how John Fetterman has been recovering from his stroke. Uh, and you saw a big shift in polling then. But it looks like, uh, you know, the polls were wrong or people changed their minds. Uh, and again, can you just imagine what this would look like if Republicans had not run 
a, uh, a TV doctor who really was from New Jersey, mm -hmm. <laughs> had fewer ties to Pennsylvania. So the fact that, uh, you know, John Fetterman uh, got the win, that there was a lot of work done behind the scenes, I'm sure. Was it, w w I'm curious, were Republicans, uh, within Republican circles, were they angry about the choice of, of Mehmet Oz? A lot of Republicans were very much hoping for uh, David McCormick, a businessman who, you know, the establishment-type uh, candidate. Mm -hmm. uh, but, of course, there was another uh, another sort of, let's say, Trumpy candidate in the mix. And so, <laughs> uh, you know, things didn't work out as I think the GOP would have liked in Pennsylvania. Quick thought from you, Karun. Well, I mean, just to add to what your correspondent was saying, Fox News has also called this for John Fetterman. So when Fox and MSNBC are in agreement, it's pretty much <laughs> done. Um, I, well, I mean, yeah, I, I would just also add that, you know, um, uh, in terms of the question about polling, uh, there was some discussion. Uh, this goes back to something Frank mm -hmm. Luntz mentioned, but the GOP did seem to put out a whole lot of like booster polls, basically polls that pe they were conducting that were more about you know internal numbers. There were questions about whether Democrats should be responding with the same. They chose not mm -hmm. to do it. It seems like maybe those polls that Luntz was saying aren't as quality polls as some right. of the ones we were doing before to get everybody excited were bad data, right? And they got maybe everybody complacent. Who knows? Or maybe it was just skewed our thinking. But it seems like the thinking did not change the same way that the polls that flooded the zone had us thinking that they might have. It's why the only polls that count are exactly. the ones on this day. All right. So let's bring in Susan Orriston, who is uh, still outside the White House. Susan, any anything more from President Biden? Anyone sending snacks down or you anything? Know, I wish I could be like Katie and have Joe Biden unexpectedly <laughs> appear on Pebble Beach here and we could go out and find out what he was really thinking. But surely, if John Fetterman is declared the victor in uh, Pennsylvania, he'll be marking that up as another win tonight, even though he could lose the House still and the Senate, as Paul has said. You know, he's feeling a lot more optimistic than perhaps he did at the beginning of the day. He always said he was optimistic, but he did say this week that if the uh, Republicans flipped control of both chambers, that it would be a, a horrible two years. And he's not looking at that very dark picture. Uh, we haven't heard very much from the White House at all tonight, except he tweeted out, uh, his team tweeted out a picture of him on the phone calling some of the winners tonight uh, for the Democrats. And he would be proud of some of, many of them, including uh, Abigail Spanberger in Northern Virginia, about 45 minutes from here. Uh, the Democrats really wanted to hold on to that seat, and it was seen as sort of a symbol of how they were going to do tonight. She did win that seat, and of course, we are seeing better than expected results for Democrats tonight. However, this still complicates Biden's job. If the House is flipped, it makes it more difficult for him to get his agenda through. There's talk that Republicans could attack some of his policies and even launch investigations. And so it's, it has changed the political climate for Joe Biden. And also, you know, this week he's expected to uh, leave the United States and go to COP in, uh, in Egypt and also on to the G20. So um, he's got a lot of, you know, strategizing to do before then. And we do expect to hear from the president tomorrow morning. Uh, probably a pretty upbeat president, even though he loses power. We'll see. We'll see what happens. It's not over yet. All right, no. Susan, uh, hang out a little longer. Maybe there'll be breakfast there. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, you can bet these results are being watched very closely here in our own nation's capital. That's where we find chief political correspondent Rosie Barton tracking what this all means for Canada. So, Rosie, uh, the issues top of mind for the federal government as they watch these numbers come in would be what right now? I mean, I mean, let's start with the economy, right? Obviously, this is one of the biggest trading relationships in the world. A trillion dollars in goods and services uh, passed through across our borders in, in 2021. I would also say this, Adrian: if this is a bad night for the Democrats, some of that could be chalked up to uh, the state of the economy in the United States, particularly inflation and the signs that perhaps the U.S. is headed towards a slowdown, even, dare I say, a recession. That's a pretty strong message that this government has to take away. It's 
itself, um, that governments wear the brunt of economic problems and inflation, whether they control part of that or not. So that would be something, I think, that the Liberals would want to analyze and, and look at very closely. I think the other issue that is um, top of mind is energy and the environment. Joe Biden uh, killed Keystone on his first day in office. There is another important pipeline uh, that is uh, potentially n not going forward smoothly either, and that is in Michigan. If the governor there uh, keeps her job, line five will be contested again. That's a very important pipeline for Canada, and this government is fully supportive of it going ahead. On the environment, Democrats obviously have the same values as, as the Liberal government on fighting climate change, and Joe Biden tried to put a lot of those things into the Inflation Reduction Act, and, and the government hopes that that will go ahead with almost $300 billion in spending on green initiatives. However, there are also challenges there uh, as the United States tries to really take control a lot of the private capital for green investment. And we know that Republicans have typically been far more open to trade and less protectionist than Democrats. So there's lots of moving parts here. And, and I think most liberals, people inside government tonight would tell you that they can find a way to work with everyone. And there are pluses and minuses on both sides of the aisle. All right, Rosie, thanks for that. We have some breaking news out of Pennsylvania. Let's bring Ian right in on this. Well, the ups and downs of the Senate campaign for John Fetterman. Uh, he started out as such a strong candidate, the lieutenant governor of the state. Then he suffered a stroke just before the primary, and that definitely affected his abilities, certainly to communicate during the campaign. He was involved in a debate with Dr. Oz. Many felt that strategically that was the wrong decision and raised questions about whether he had the cognitive abilities to do the job. It was thought to be a very close race. It was a very close race, but our decision desk following the lead of NBC and other uh, media organizations in the United States, though this is close, though a lot of votes are still to be um, counted, uh, feel confident enough to say that John Fetterman has now won this, and uh, he is on stage right now with, uh, you can tell he's happy as he's about to uh, celebrate being the new senator and uh, a gain for the Democrats from Pennsylvania. All right, probably a good time to uh, go to Katie Simpson, who, of course, is right there where the action is. Katie? Uh, well, John Fetterman is coming out on the stage right now, and he says he's not quite sure what to say right now. If anyone ha would have predicted that this was going to happen this quickly, uh, they'd probably say, give your head a shake. And so the crowd is very excited here. You can see they're very enthusiastic. The people who hung in here to the very end, because again, this wasn't supposed to happen tonight. This was going to take days. We're talking about things like election weeks a term. Adrian, you let me know if you want to listen in a little bit. Um, no, we're, we're good, Katie. We're good. You keep going. So the unexpected. This is a net, or this is a pickup for the Democrats. This was a seat uh, that was held by a Republican who decided to retire, and this was a very intense race that had national implications in the way that so many of the issues that played out here on the campaign trail also happened in other areas. There's the Biden factor. There's the Trump factor. The Trump factor being election deniers were on the ballot. More than half of the Republicans running in these races in this election cycle for election deniers. And we are seeing uh, uh, some of the strongest voices. They were soundly defeated. The, the Republican running for governor, he lost pretty soundly. Uh, Dr. Oz, he did question uh, the results of the 2020 election. And we are seeing it was close here. It's very close. But the fact that it's actually closed or been called on election night, that is unexpected. And this is a significant win for Democrats. And as John Fetterman is saying right now, that we did what we needed to do, he says. And really, this was a tough, a deeply personal political tonight, value battle, and tonight he's the victor. I'll be the next US All right, Senate. Katie Simpson. The action is thank you, Katie. We're going to keep this conversation going on this pinnacle race in Pennsylvania right after the break. All right, you're looking at John Fetterman with his family speaking tonight after his win for the Senate in Pennsylvania in a very close race. This is a key pickup for Democrats. 
All right, with us now, Paul Hunter, Karun Demergen, a correspondent with the Washington Post, Kelly Jane Torrance, an editor at the New York Post. Okay, so it's it's close. Uh, Fetterman appears to have won. It's It's been called. I know we were still watching it. You found it fascinating. It's a pickup for the Democrats now. So what does that mean? It is a pickup, which means they um, have a chance of putting themselves in a slightly better position. I mean, look, the, the, as long as Biden is the president, a 50-50 split, tie goes to the runner. Mm -hmm. It's the vice president can come in and break ties. 51 votes doesn't give you that much more of a governing coalition mm -hmm. than 50 votes does, but it's a little bit of a cushion. And, you know, if they can keep Warnock's seat, and he is leading Herschel Walker now and inching up to that 50% threshold, um, and they can just keep any more losses from happening, every seat helps because their map is so much harder two years from now. So... Um, it just it, it, it doesn't change the politics of it. It gives Joe Manchin, I guess, a little bit of less bargaining power. Yeah. But you know, but but generally speaking, the filibuster still stays where it is. They don't have like a they can't do the runway to do whatever they want. Okay. But it's better than every every seat helps. Can you Canadianize this conversation, Paul? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's better than 49, isn't it? I mean, I mean, it's it's it it remains a win. I mean, Joe Biden has a right to feel pretty darn good yeah. right now, right? We mm -hmm. we still we wait on the House, but on the Senate side and with Fetterman, these are unexpected things. I mean, how many times tonight have we said we all we we it was gonna be a sea of red, mm -hmm. you know, and it, mm -hmm. it isn't that. It's, it's, and it's better than just not being that, back to my double negatives. It's, it's a good night for Democrats and Joe Biden, even if he doesn't hang on to the House. It's, this is a very good, he's got a reason to feel good. Yeah. Uh, j just briefly here, um, Kelly, the conversation, the hard conversation amongst Republicans tonight is what? I think it's, uh, you know, I was talking to, to a couple friends, and uh, one agrees that this is kind of a mirror image of what happened in 2020. The Democrats uh, got what they wanted, but much more narrowly, because they thought they could just run against President Trump and do well. This time, the Republicans thought they could just run against President Biden and automatically do much better than they did. Uh, so, you know, neither mm. party has really given Americans uh, a strong, uh, you know, message of what they were going to do. And Americans uh, aren't too convinced by either party mm -hmm. in many ways. I think that uh, neither right now has a huge mandate to do a lot. And, uh, you know, let's... I almost hope we see some gridlock because uh, I think Americans don't want some of the big changes that uh, on the edges of both parties that they would be looking for. I think we would call that in Canada minority government. <laughs> All right, we're going to keep a close eye on the midterm results. We're also following other news for you tonight, including a CBC News investigation into a controversial soccer match Canada was supposed to host earlier this year. Uh, it's, uh, it wasn't a very good idea to invite the Iranian uh, soccer team here to Canada. Tonight, what we've learned was happening behind the scenes, even as public outrage grew. Plus... I asked her the question, she should answer me. A heated exchange at the UN Climate Change Conference in Egypt. This one was not about the environment. And... So there's a rumor going on that you may be interested in buying an NHL professional hockey team, the Ottawa Senators. Interesting. Ryan Reynolds confirms the rumors, but does he have the cash? We're back in two. Welcome back to the National Studio. You're home tonight for special coverage of the U.S. midterm elections. More results in just a moment. But first, a CBC News exclusive about a controversial plan for Canada to host Iran for a soccer match earlier this year. At the time, the Prime Minister denounced the game. Tonight, Ashley Burke has documents that reveal what was happening behind the scenes. As Canada was gearing up for a World Cup warm-up match against Iran, controversy was growing. Even the Prime Minister denounced Canada soccer's plan. It's, uh, it wasn't a very good idea to invite the Iranian uh, soccer team here to Canada. But CBC News has learned that days later, government departments continued discussions behind the scenes about facilitating the match. An earlier email shows global affairs had raised concerns. If visas are not issued, Iran could launch an official complaint against Canada soccer, and it could argue that Canada should not host the World Cup in 2026. It's not acceptable for us. Hamid Ismailian's wife and daughter were among Canadians killed almost three years ago. 
when Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps shot down their flight. He was among the families writing letters demanding the match be called off over concerns Iranians with ties to the Revolutionary Guard could be part of the delegation. We knew that IRGC is usually part of the team going to any country that the national teams in Iran go. In fact, the government received 58 visa requests from Iranians, including officials who were not players on the team, a higher number than expected. <laughs> officials even discussed how global affairs might have to issue special travel exemption letters to Iran's delegation because of the tight deadline. I think it's shocking. It's a shocking misuse of the national interest letter process. They're meant to be for very, used very sparingly and only in the most uh, uh, important circumstances. An exhibition game against the Iranians uh, certainly doesn't qualify. But ultimately, those letters weren't issued or visas expedited before Canada soccer called off the match under public pressure. The soccer organization now says that it was a mistake to schedule the game against Iran and so far has not faced any penalties for calling the match off. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. And there's some breaking political news out of Alberta tonight. The CBC News decision desk is projecting a win for Alberta Premier Danielle Smith in a by-election in Brooks Medicine Hat. Until now, Smith did not have a seat in the legislature. She became Premier last month after winning the leadership of the United Conservative Party. The family of a Saskatchewan man says he was killed fighting in Ukraine over the weekend. Joseph Hildebrand was a farmer from Saskatchewan and a Canadian Forces veteran who served two tours in Afghanistan. His family says they've received word he was among 12 soldiers who died fighting in the Donetsk region. Saskatchewan Premier Scott Moe called Hildebrand a hero, saying his decision to take up arms once again to defend Ukraine was a remarkable demonstration of courage and selflessness. Ukraine's president says Russia's war on his country is threatening global climate goals. There can be no effective climate policy without the peace on the earth. Volodymyr Zelensky addressed the UN climate change conference in Egypt today. He warned about the potential dangers of an accident at a nuclear power plant occupied by Russian forces. Zelensky also said Russia's invasion has contributed to energy and food crises. As world leaders meet in Egypt, there are serious concerns about that country's human rights record. Chris Brown has the story of a sister who's trying to capitalize on this moment and save her brother's life. At COP27, the drive to save the planet collided with host Egypt's abysmal record on human rights. With Sana Saif, sister of the country's highest profile political prisoner, in the middle of it. I ask her the question, she should answer me. In a chaotic news conference, an Egyptian MP accused her of being a puppet for Western governments. I'm really worried. She told us no one knows the condition of her brother, Ala Abdel Fattah. We don't know. Uh, since he stopped water, we haven't had any proof of life. Abdel Fattah is a blogger who protested military rule. He spent the better part of a decade imprisoned and is now on a hunger and water strike. Okay. She's asking I Canada British, to pressure uh, Egypt for his access. release. I know Ali is not Canadian, but uh, but other other embassies can show their solidarity. Her pleas have galvanized civil society groups here who say without political freedoms, you can't have progress on climate. The government of Egypt does not take concrete action to release him within the next um, few days. He will die. He will die. And this ghost will haunt COP27. Canada's Minister of Environment and Climate Change, Stephen Guilbeault, told us he's raised the matter with Egypt. The Canadian government is uh, having very uh, frank and honest conversation about human rights with the Egyptian government. It started before the COP, it's happening during COP, it will continue after COP. The Egyptian government claims this is a matter for the courts. Wael Abu Magad is a former ambassador to Canada. We would hope that uh, conditions are uh, appropriate and that he chooses not to harm himself in that fashion. Sana Saif says she fears her brother may be force-fed to keep him alive while the UN delegates are here. Several European leaders have also raised his case, which is now arguably getting as much attention as the climate talks. Chris Brown, CBC News, in Sharm el-Sheikh.
Back in this country, tens of thousands of education workers are back on the job in Ontario. Students back in class and the province back in the bargaining table with what it's calling an improved offer. I don't want to fight. I just want the kids in school. Um, that, that's what I want to do. You know, I'm, I'm past the stage of, of fighting. Workers walked off the job last week, shuttering schools after the province enacted legislation that imposed a contract and made it illegal to strike. The province is now promising to repeal that legislation. Education workers have been without a collective agreement since August 31st. Canada health ministers have been meeting this week, pushing the federal government for more money. This is unfolding while millions of Canadians are struggling to find a family doctor. As Julia Wong explains, that's putting pressure on hospital ERs already pushed to the brink. Michael Tryon needs to piece together a solution to an urgent problem. He and his son are on the hunt for a new family doctor. We have uh, been watching for signs on the street. You know, you do see them. That says, you know, new doctor in this practice or taking new patients. Tryon and his wife are getting older, and so is his doctor, who retires at the end of the month. Don't want to turn up in an ER unless you're dying, or you've got a broken bone. But that is what's happening. In some ERs, up to a third of patients do not have a family physician, and some come with minor requests, like prescription refills. It's not uncommon to have people come in and say, I know I don't really need to be in the ER, but I need this done, I need to see a physician, and I don't have any other options. It obviously increases our volume. It increases the wait time. Honestly, I'm surprised these days when a patient does have a family doctor. Edmonton ER doctor Aisha Mirza worries for those patients. Patients are extremely vulnerable to having things missed and becoming more sick and ultimately not getting the appropriate care that they need. To deal with demand, one chain of walk-in clinics started a program where nurses treat patients with minor issues. We believe that that will help support uh, and perhaps relieve some of that pressure on the ERs. The College of Family Physicians of Canada says the pandemic made the shortage worse. Some of them are retiring and many of them are just transitioning into an easier area of practice. Medical students see that and they choose against community-based family practice. The college is calling for incentives to keep doctors from leaving their practice and release staff to backfill so doctors can take time off. Solutions that will take time, meaning the pressure on the healthcare system is not going anywhere soon. Julia Wong, CBC News, Edmonton. It turns out the rumors are true. Ryan Reynolds confirms he is interested in buying the Ottawa Senators. It's very expensive. So, you know, yeah, I need, not like I, need a, yeah. Yeah, I need a partner with, you know, really deep pockets. <laughs> Reynolds told Jimmy Fallon on The Tonight Show that he would like to buy the team as part of a consortium. It seems the Sens fans were watching. It gave Reynolds a standing ovation at tonight's game. The team announced last week that it was up for sale. So let's get back to those other senators, the ones south of the border. John Fetterman now among them winning the seat in Pennsylvania after a hard-fought race. Stay with us. All right, welcome back as we continue to track results in the U.S. midterm elections. Very close race for control of both chambers. Let's take a look at the House of Representatives right now. Remember, 218 is the number needed for control. Look at that. Uh, leading or elected, it doesn't, it doesn't get tighter than that. Let's have a look at the race for the Senate. It was 50-50 coming into it tonight. What does it look like now? The Republicans only needed to flip one to take control. Again, 51-49, these are just leading and elected. The numbers could change a little bit as more votes are counted. Those are the broad strokes. We need details, which is why we're going to go to Ian, who's watching these races closely with some last thoughts. Boy, Senate close. We expected it early on, and it certainly has played out after all these hours of live coverage during our, uh, our news special here. Let's take a look at Georgia and... One thing has been consistent through the night, and that is how close this has been. 
what's changed is who is in the lead. And right now, the incumbent Senator Raphael Warnock, as you can see, is in a lead. And, and really, by Georgia Tuesday night standards, that's a big lead because at times it's been within maybe one-tenth uh, of one percentage point. Just 81% of the precincts counted to this point. And as we've been saying throughout the evening and into the early morning, if a candidate does not get 50% plus one here, then it goes to a runoff. So there's still a possibility we will have a winner for this race by the time Georgia finishes counting, but it's also possible, possible it'll go to that runoff on December the 6th. Let's take a look at another close... Uh, well, actually, this is uh, Nevada, where we've been waiting all evening for, for the results to come in. A whole bunch came in what, about half an hour ago. And if you remember, it was about the same percentage as right now. So there are still a lot of votes to be counted. And, uh, and so it seems that that next step in Nevada has slowed down a little bit. It's quite possible, well, it's almost certain that the control of the Senate will come down to what happens in Georgia and or Nevada. So a lot of attention being paid here. Uh, let's finish, though, this uh, kind of look at results with someone who we can declare is elected, Gretchen Whitmer, the, uh, the governor in Michigan who had been the subject of uh, some extremist, who was a victim of some extremist who wanted to kidnap her, um, who was up against a uh, Trump acolyte, uh, very conservative Tudor D Dixon, and uh, Gretchen Whitmer is going to continue as the governor of Michigan, Adrian. All right, so interesting. Ian, thank you. Uh, this is a good time to bring in our senior Washington correspondent, Paul Hunter, crew and Demergent, a, a correspondent with the Washington Post, Kelly Jane Torrance of the New York Post. One more time tonight. This is your, this is your hot takes moment there, Karim. <laughs> okay, I got a couple. I bet you do. Um, first of all, I think um, Mitch McConnell was vindicated. You need to run good candidates. And if you don't run good candidates, you can lose races where you should win. Um, second, I think um, abortion rights matter a lot mm -hmm. in the United States. There was this dismissing of, oh, it's not really about that. That was a hot issue for the summer, but it's gone. Clearly, it matters. Uh, the, some of these uh, ballot questions haven't been completely closed, but it's trending in protecting abortion rights, even in the conservative states that we're trying to shut them down. Third thing, I think with this map that we're seeing right now, or the, the layout of the House especially, I think Ukraine aid is safe right now. You don't have so all even if of they the have control, it's not enough because you have the Republicans. Like you know, the, 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 there are Republicans in the GOP in the House who think that you should have more scrutiny of where the money's going and more oversight. But Democrats want to do that too. But they still think the money should keep flowing. And remember, Republicans in the Senate are hawks. They still want the money to keep flowing, mm -hmm. too. You don't have enough of a coalition right now, the GOP, to pull the Democrats who are feeling wishy-washy about it, but we're kind of embarrassed when they publicly said that a couple of weeks ago, along to do that. I don't even think you necessarily have enough of a coalition of the GOP to launch every last investigation that they want to launch. Some will get launched, but mm -hmm. maybe not every last one. It's not a free-for-all. And I guess just last thing, as I would say, is, like, this is an embarrassing night for the GOP. It, it, it just is. Like, I mean, it, the, the midterm election after 20, Trump won in 2018, Democrats did get about 40 seats, right? And we don't even know now who is actually going to control the House of Representatives come January. Interesting. That should have been a foregone conclusion. We're assuming still, but those races haven't been called, which means this is on a razor's edge, and that's not good for where they started out. Kelly Jane, does this give Donald Trump some pause tonight? I hope so. Uh, I think we're all <laughs> hoping so. Uh, no, the big winner tonight, I, you know, that we can clearly see, first of all, is Ron DeSantis, who, again, as I mentioned earlier, won Miami-Dade County, heavily Hispanic county, first Republican to win it since uh, Jeb Bush in 2002. Uh, and looking at the exit polls is uh, and how Hispanics voted, again, not, a, you know, a voting block that's uh, monolithic, but one that has been shifting Republican in the last few years. So people are going to be looking at that. Uh, Stacey Abrams conceded tonight. That was a bit of a surprise to me. Mm. Uh, she never actually <laughs> conceded until, I think, about a month or so ago uh, from her uh, last race against Brian Kemp. So uh, that was a big surprise. And, you know, I agree with Kern. The, the candidates do matter, and we really found that out tonight. Um, and, you know, I do wonder, for example, uh, Dr. Raw's not the best candidate, but was he brought even further down by Doug Mastriano, who was uh, someone who was very much a stop the steal uh, January 6 type, uh, who was running for Pennsylvania governor and, and lost pretty badly. Uh, might he have brought uh, laws down if people were kind of voting a straight ticket in that case? 
I think that's uh, one thing we have to sort of think about, too. Uh, Kathy Hochul won in New York, of course, smaller margin than, uh, much smaller margin than when Andrew Cuomo last won four years ago. And it looks like there are three uh, Republican pickups in the Hudson Valley, including the head of Democrats' uh, com campaign arm in the House, Sean Patrick Maloney. Might Kathy Hochul have brought a few Democrats down with her? So these are things we're all going to be, of course, looking at tomorrow. So you're an editor at the New York Post. What's your headline tomorrow? Uh, you know what I forgot to ask, and my laptop died right as I was oh, the segment oh. was starting. Uh, but I can tell you that uh, in the opinion pages, um, we, you know, Hochul won, but she has a big task ahead of her. Uh, and so I think that's the case, of course, for uh, Republicans looking into tomorrow. And, you know, not, you know, it'll be uh, Mitch McConnell versus Rick Scott. Rick Scott, of course, uh, the head of the Senate uh, uh, campaign uh, arm and was really pushing some of these bad candidates when Mitch McConnell was taking away campaign funding from some of them. So uh, they'll be fighting about that, too. Should we have put more money into these people? Should we have put less? But the interesting thing about Donald Trump is uh, it didn't look like he was putting much money, and mm -hmm. he's got a huge war chest no, behind it's just the candidates that, that he capital. actually... Uh, yeah, he was pushing candidates but not putting his money where right. his mouth is. Right. So um, I would say the last minute and a half of hot takes, <laughs> we must owe it to you, Paul Hunter. <laughs> um... You know, my head is still intact, but my mind is blown by, by what we've seen tonight. I think the headline is Joe Biden lives. Um, right. This was a good night for uh, John Fetterman. This was a good night for Ron DeSantis. This was a very good night for Joe Biden. Um, and it was not a good night for Donald Trump. You know, will this be enough to dissuade him from throwing his hat in the ring? Mm -hmm. Who knows? This was a good night for American voters. Uh, there are not riots on the streets tonight. Uh, there are not uh, riots at polling stations in, you know, that we know of Absolutely. anyway, not yet. Um, they figured out how to count votes quickly. We, th we thought we'd be here for days, not here, 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 but be waiting. Mm -hmm. And so far we aren't. I mean, it, things have been figured out. And these are all, those are good things. We've talked a lot about the threat mm -hmm. to democracy. It, it worked out tonight, and, and that's a good thing. But at the end of the day, the headline, I think, is this was a very good night for Joe Biden and Democrats. Interesting. Let's, um, you, you're presuming all, all these results are accepted. Let's see. Let, let's, it, let's. it has that feel, doesn't it? I mean, it sure it, it, there's going to be some tweakage, maybe. It doesn't matter. It, one where it's, It was a good night for Democrats. Okay, before <laughs> we head to break, that big Republican win in Florida that we mentioned this evening, Ron DeSantis, with a victory speech that sounded very much like a presidential campaign speech. We have embraced freedom. We have maintained law and order. We have protected the rights of parents. We have respected our taxpayers, and we reject woke ideology. DeSantis went into the vote with a pretty strong lead. His quick win only raises the Republican governor's profile and speculation about a possible showdown between DeSantis and Donald Trump over the 2024 Republican nomination. Stay with us. Well, it's almost 2 a.m. in Washington, D.C. Time for one last look at Congress. Both houses too close to call. Pretty surprising night. There was no red wave, no red tsunami. So many were expecting. So, Ian, um, <laughs> if you can pull back for us, where do the chambers stand right now, accepting that things could change a bit? Yeah, but you know what? Uh, you know this from election coverage over the years. We do these rehearsals sometimes, mm -hmm. and we put in scenarios, and we know they're not actually going to work mm -hmm. out, but it's just good to you know practice those. When I look at these numbers, it feels like one of those scenarios that isn't real, and I keep thinking to myself, no, it's actually real. We're actually live on the air. We never expected it to look like this at this time in the evening. And yes, with your disclaimer that it could change, but as of now, after many hours of counting, 218 districts for control, the Republican Republicans with just 218. You could have won whatever bet you wanted six hours ago if you had been able to bet that this is where these numbers were going to be right now. We always knew the Senate was going to be close. We didn't expect to see this number. But of course, we have Georgia, a virtual dead heat. 
That could change things right now. The Democratic candidate, the incumbent senator, is uh, in the lead there. If that were to change, it would be 50-50. And of course, Nevada, we only have about, I think it was 30% of the districts reporting at this moment. That could change as well. So a lot of eyes on Nevada and, uh, and on Georgia throughout the night and early in the morning. And in the case of Georgia, Adrian, if it goes to a runoff, December the 6th is when we'll know who wins that race. What's the most curious thing you saw tonight? I think the back and forth. I think it also, I guess the other thing is just especially on Twitter and other social media, how sure people were of what the poll results were telling them of the mistakes that parties made six hours ago and now how sure they are about what the voters have shown everybody, right? Oh, we were right all along. We were wrong all along. And so, but here's the bottom line. We learned tonight, once again, votes matter, elections matter, nights like this matter, and I don't care how you feel from a partisan standpoint, that's a great reminder. Absolutely. Uh, eloquent, as always, Ian Hennemansing, co-host of The National. Uh, going to be an interesting day for pollsters tomorrow to have a hard conversation, lots of interesting conversations to have Joe, to have Joe Biden might be sleeping well this evening. A big thanks to Karun, Kelly Jane, Paul Hunter, our entire CBC News team on both sides of the border in the control rooms behind us in the studio. Thank you so much for being with us. Have a good night. Tomorrow and in the days to come, CBC News will continue to bring you the latest on this election and its impact on Canada. CBC News Network, CBC Radio, and right here.